Your ranger's expert tracking skills have brought you to the mouth of the cave, only to find the demons you were hunting are massacred and strewn about the entrance. It looks like someone, or something, has solved your problem for you. Little do you know, your problems are just getting started. Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Monster of the Week. Today we are talking about Kythons. In this video we're going to talk about what Kythons actually are, what kind of abilities and tactics they can use against your adventurers, some possible modifications, and some story hooks based around Kythons that you could use in your game. So, to get started, what is a Kython? In addition to having a name that my phone can't seem to help itself from autocorrecting to Python, they're insectoid monsters with an exoskeleton that spew acid, and are basically the closest thing in D&D you're going to get to a xenomorph. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about these guys. The alien from Alien. The Kython is found in the infamous Book of Vile Darkness, which is a 3.0 book, and as far as I know, they haven't been printed in any other edition after that or before. They're extremely cool, and I'm really excited to show you all that they have to offer. So to get things started off, we'll talk about their origin story. According to the book, a group of fiends was trapped on the material plane, and in a desperate act to try to recreate more of their own kind there, they ended up creating these monstrous insectoid creatures, which of course ended up killing all of the demons who created them. And this is how they come by their nickname, Earthbound Demons. That in and of itself is a really cool role-playing application and could help these guys fit into a story in a really cool way. As the story goes, after their creation, they spread throughout the world breeding rapidly. And how do they breed, you ask? They are all hatched from large mucus-covered eggs. There's no illustration in the book, but I imagine they probably look a little something like this. If this isn't ringing any bells for you yet, I suggest you go watch Alien. Seriously, you should do it. It's a good movie. They are completely devoid of any emotion, mercy, pity, compassion, anything. Their sole drive is just propagating their own species and eating. Which on the surface might make them seem a little shallow, but trust me, it's gonna get good. One really interesting feature about them is the language they speak is completely unique to them, but it is a combination of infernal and abyssal. Meaning that if you have a character in your party who speaks one of those two languages, you could use this as a storytelling application for when they're speaking to each other. They might be able to pick out a few words here or there that could allude to what they're actually talking about. And they only speak to one another. The book specifies that they will never try to communicate with someone outside of the brood, nor do they show any signs they can even understand what people are saying to them. They're all eyeless, but they have blind sense out to 60 feet, and they have many defenses, including immunity to acid and cold, and they have resistance to fire and electricity. They're more or less merciless killing machines, and this is part of why I think they make excellent villains. Now there is a brood hierarchy which is basically dictated by how evolved a Kython is, with the weaker ones basically deferring to those that are more evolved than them. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the different types of Kythons, we're going to talk about each one and if it has any unique abilities, and then we're going to move on to modifying them a little bit. So first up we have the Broodling. These are literally the newborns of the brood. They're not very strong, they don't even have arms yet, however they do have a poisonous sting and bite attack. They're pretty straightforward, fairly weak and ultimately at any hive of these guys, you're gonna find a bunch of them. They're at the bottom rung of the hierarchy. Next up, we have the juvenile. The juvenile kythons are basically just starting to grow up. They finally get two claws that they can attack with. They're a little bigger, and of course a little bit stronger. So they can still use their tail and bite, but now they have two claws to attack with. Basically just your standard upgrade to the next stage, what you'd expect. Third up the ladder, we have adult kythons. As an adult, they lose the tail completely, but they gain two more claws. I'd say that's a pretty good trade-off. They also get a lot bigger, and for a lot of Kythons, this is their final form. The adult Kython is basically the frontline soldier. They still, of course, retain their poisonous bite, but now they can do multiple attacks with their claws. Now, like I said, this is the final form for many Kythons, but a select few will evolve into even higher roles. One of these stages is called an Impaler. Now, an Impaler basically acts as an assassin for the leader of the brood. They remain totally dormant until someone either infiltrates the nest or has been deemed an enemy of the swarm, at which point they awaken and follow their instructions to eliminate whoever or whatever it is that they're after. Most Kythons are pretty good at sneaking around, but these guys get an even bigger bonus to stealth checks, and they have large spikes that they can protrude out of their hands. Their MO is to just get in, 
kill whatever it is you're supposed to kill, and then get out. So you can be sure that if a powerful group of adventurers is caught intruding in the nest, it's only a matter of time before one of these guys comes after them. Next up, we have the Slay Master. Slay Masters actually forego their newfound claws and revert back somewhat to the broodling stage except they remain much larger. In fact, they grow even larger than their adult selves. In a lot of cases, these guys will act as the leader of a brood. The book actually specifies they seem to enjoy killing more than the unemotional members of the swarm, which alludes to the fact that they're awakened a little bit. In order to run the swarm, they would clearly have to be a little bit more intelligent and cognitive. So this in a lot of ways could be seen by the players or the people in the world as the first steps to something a lot more terrifying. They're a lot more focused on grappling and poisoning their opponents more so than clawing at them. And if they do manage to get a hold on you, they're going to do a ton of damage. One other interesting feature is that the Slay Master has the option to reduce its blind sense down to 30 feet, and in doing so, he gains two abilities. The first one is called Disruption Field. Disruption Field gives a negative to any creatures within 30 feet that try to make an attack or save, or basically any rolls that the players try to make. And any spell cast within its 30 foot vicinity has a 10% chance of just straight up failing. His other option is putting up an enhanced defense field. In doing this, he gets a bonus to armor class and gains spell resistance. The Slay Master also has the option to reduce its blind sense by 60, so 30 for the first ability and 30 again for the second ability, making him effectively blind, but he then becomes much more difficult to kill. So if you're playing your Slay Master in a situation where he has a lot of minions attacking the party, this could be a good way for him to kind of try to survive if there's no escape route. Now, on to the final evolution, the Slaughter King. According to the book, until Slaughter Kings came along, the Slay Masters just ruled unopposed. But once the first one of these guys came about, they took command like they owned the place. They basically look like more intimidating and regal adults, except for the fact that these guys are 12 feet tall. They are absolute monsters, and in a lot of ways represent the pinnacle of what these Kythons aspire to. They are a very rare mutation, and if you have one of these in your game, you bet he's going to be running the brood. The Slaughter King can open his mouth wide like a snake to swallow any prey that will fit, and he also has access to the Disruption Field and Enhanced Defense options. Now, unlike his lessers, the Slaughter King also has more of a tendency for battle, to the point where he craves battle. And when this craving goes on for a long time without him having combat, the Slaughter King will leave the lair to go off and just kill non-Kythons for a while, and then come back home when he's finished. Again, this sort of implies that the further up the evolutionary chain these guys go, the more personality starts to develop, and the more their bloodlust starts to develop, which is leading up to something very scary. These guys are absolutely monstrous, and would make for a very intense encounter. So, you're probably thinking, what could possibly be after the Slaughter King? Well, that's for you to decide. So the cool thing about these guys, and this isn't even just me saying we should modify them in this way, this is literally in the book. And I quote, The Slaughter Kings are the highest Kython authority. At least so far. Given time, the Kythons may grow into new forms that are even more specialized and powerful. How awesome is that? The author of this monster is literally saying, there's no reason to stop here. They certainly won't. Life finds a way, right? But life, uh, finds a way. Their next form could be anything, and it's totally up to you to fit that into your campaign. One possible variant I've thought of could be an awakened Slaughter King, where his brain suddenly evolves to the next level, and he starts to have emotions, and thoughts, and ambition. How cool would that be for a story hook? Maybe these Kythons have been living peacefully in the mountains for generations, never bothering anyone who didn't go up there, and suddenly they're attacking cities and villages and no one understands why. Or, why stop now? Let's rip off aliens some more. Maybe there's a Kython queen who's now able to reproduce Kythons at an unprecedented rate. As they start to run out of space, the brood is forced to expand. So, these guys are pretty awesome, right? Well, there's one last feature that we haven't talked about, which is really cool. According to the book, whenever a Kython lays an egg, they have an option on what they want it to hatch into. They can have it hatch into another broodling, further expanding the swarm, or they can have it hatch into a weapon. And not just any weapon, an organic weapon that the Kython can then graft onto its body and use in battle. So, what kind of weapons can they make? Well, there is a percentile table in the Book of Vile Darkness, or you just pick one that you like and put it on a specific Kython. So, let's talk about what these weapons are and what they do. So the most common type of weapon is the Acid Spitter. 
The acid spitter is basically an organic crossbow that shoots globs of acid. The Kython can use it 10 times per hour, and it's as simple as that. Next up, we have the Bone Shard crossbow. Again, an organic weapon that basically looks like a repeating crossbow that shoots out sharp splinters of bone at its opponent. The bone splinter itself only actually deals one damage, but it carries venom from the type of Kython that's using it. So depending on what type of Kython it is, that venom is going to be anywhere from an inconvenience to nearly lethal. Next, we have the Bone Blade. Literally a sword made out of bone grafted onto the Kython's arm. It augments his claw attack, so instead of random slashing, it's precision slicing. As you can imagine, this simply increases the damage that the Kython does with his melee attacks. He can also get extra armor. This doesn't actually augment any of his attacks, but it gives him a plus two bonus to AC as he gets more chit in his armor to cover his body. Next up, and my personal favorite, is the Mouth Launcher. This is literally a smaller mouth that goes inside the Kython's mouth, like Alien, and launches out and grabs its opponent and pulls it in, giving the Kython a free bite attack if it successfully grapples the opponent. Then we have the Mucus Pod, which is a pod of yellow liquid that goes onto the Kython's arm. When the Kython makes a claw attack, it can launch the Mucus all over its opponent. This Mucus is very sticky, prevents them from moving and taking certain actions. You either have to wait the appropriate amount of time to get out of it, or you can dissolve it with alcohol. And lastly, we have the phase organ. This is a small organ that goes onto the back of the Kython's head. This special device allows the Kython to become incorporeal, or then corporeal again, as a free action on its turn. This is particularly useful for impalers, but honestly, any enemy that can slash at you and then disappear is gonna cause problems. The thing I love about these guys is the book leaves a lot of it open to you as a DM to customize. Because as great as all of the classic enemies are, such as Beholders or Gnolls, your players will kind of have an expectation for how they work. I can guarantee you that almost none of your players will have heard of Kythons, and the few who have will know that they shouldn't know what to expect. There's so much potential for adventures just based on what's in the book, and that's not even counting what kind of customizations you do with these guys. And if you have any Alien fans in the group, they're sure to appreciate it. Should you decide that you want to make them even more alien-esque, you could literally make them have acid for blood. Every time the characters slash at one, then they're risking getting acid on themselves or their weapons. While we're on the topic though, let's talk about a couple possible adventure hooks for Kythons. As we said earlier in the video, new brood variants are constantly arising as time goes on. Maybe a new variant you've come up with comes to power and directs the brood in a whole new way. Or maybe a passing merchant or other adventurer tries to sell the party a mysterious egg that he's found that ultimately hatches into a Kython. I really like the idea of some NPC coming across the egg and bringing it back to town. I really like the merchant or adventurer finding the egg scenario because it may not even go to the players. Maybe he brings it back to town and presents it to the local king or baron as a gift. Then when it inevitably hatches, gets away into a small dark corner, it starts to propagate itself, and before you know it, you have a Kython infestation in town. If you do go that route, that will create a very intense situation for your players where they're going to feel like they're on a clock to shut this down before it gets out of control. Because once the adults start emerging, that's when things are going to get crazy. Another possible scenario is maybe the demons that tried to create the Kythons themselves are coming to the players and asking them for help. This raises a lot of questions. Do you want to help demons? They seem to be in distress, but it's also kind of their own fault. Although knowing the nature of demons, they probably won't tell the players where they came from. They'll probably just tell the players they're being attacked. For some groups, they'll most certainly just kill the demons, but if you know your players kind of like to weigh their options, and some of them have a soft spot for people asking for aid, even if they're demons, that could be a good one too. Those are just a couple suggestions, but let me know in the comments below any hooks that you come up with. If you are interested in using Kythons in your game and you're not running 3rd edition or 3.5, I'd recommend checking out my video on converting 3.5 monsters to 5th edition. That should help you get started on your Kython journey. Well, that's all for today. Hopefully you found this video helpful. Hopefully you love Kythons as much as I do now. I really enjoyed talking about Kythons, so hopefully you enjoyed learning about Kythons. If you have any questions or ideas about how we could modify them better, please drop a comment below. And of course, if you enjoy the Monster of the Week series or anything else I do, please subscribe. I have at least one new video every week. Thanks for watching. See you next time.